That concludes our China Spotlight. But next up, we have Brian Stevens, EVP and CTO from Red Hat. So let's hear it for Brian. Come on up and uh, let's hear what he has to say. Welcome, Brian. Hey, everybody. So I promised my daughter something. So we got a bit of housekeeping. So if you can indulge me, please smile. I've got a number of pictures sort of standing here, but nothing of you guys. You're a pretty good looking audience. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for that. Um, so Red Hat's certainly um, a company that's been synonymous um, with open source. You know, it stands to reason we've got you know, the better part of two decades um, working in open source, but the company was founded on the open source principles, not just from a code perspective, but just sort of how we think and interact on a day-to-day -day basis inside of the company and with our customers. You know, but we've always said that, you know, never rest on your laurels, and we always felt that as much as open source has been disruptive for our customers from the perspective of operating systems, to us that just felt like the first part, the very first chapter. And so what we really think is that open source is such a defining development model that it's going to be disruptive across the whole IT space. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Today, when you actually talk to customers, sure, they talk about operating systems, but today the mission's gotten much harder. It's actually, how do they both manage and deploy, not just infrastructure, but applications alike? How do they do that at a level of scale beyond what they ever had to do in the past? How do they do that reliably? How do they do that efficiently? How do they do that nearly real time without waiting on help desk tickets? And increasingly important is how do they do that repeatedly again and again and again? You know, it's for those reasons why Red Hat is completely centered on OpenStack, not just because of the functionals, the function and the features that OpenStack is actually uh, focused on. It's because behind OpenStack is, you know, looking around is one of the most vibrant development communities. And for us, that's the best development model, you know, in the world. You know, Red Hat's whole business model sort of thrives on developing software out and open um, in these open communities. And while that sounds awesome, it also makes it very difficult because the traditional model of software development means you can actually start to slow down the cadence of feature development, and then you actually, actually can go into a qualification phase and hardening phase, and then ultimately bring that to customers. I don't think the community is going to stand for Red Hat actually telling it to slow down because now we've got to productize and make some money. So we really sort of continue to hone inside of Red Hat you know, our model, our manufacturing floor that allows the innovation to flourish in the community, but yet we can continuously take the technology inside of Red Hat, harden it, make it work with our partners, and then when we bring it to customers, not only does it have to work reliably, we have to be able to sustain that upgrade over upgrade uh, for many years to come. And it's why that we usually don't talk about products inside of Red Hat, we actually talk about subscriptions. That's the relationship that we want to have with our customers. It really is a continuum. We're not providing them a point product. We're providing them a continuum of both knowledge as well as listening to them so that when they actually have directional statements of where they need the technology to go, we can help influence those in the community. And because of that, that's why we have to be active in the community. When you look at some of the stats um, for the recent releases of OpenStack, you know, Red Hat shows up you know, at the very top. But that's not the yardstick that we measure our success on. The yardstick that we use is can we then take that technology and not just replace customer uh, proprietary technology in our customer environments. That's really not that interesting. What's really interesting is can you allow customers and empower them to do things with open source that they never could do in the past. You know, for the last two plus years, it's actually been uh, fun to actually build a team, you know, working on OpenStack. You know, that's, that's you know, really the fun part of the job. Um, and I think we've been, you know, largely very successful at that. We've got a great group of engineers, you know, represented here at the summit. We also did something earlier this year because a, a vibrant development community is important, but then you also want to get that technology as pervasively used as possible. So we created a, 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 what we call a community distribution earlier this year called RDO. And the goal of RDO is how do you take the software that's developed by thousands and get it quickly into the hands of millions? So RDO is really a unopinionated version of OpenStack as it's developed nearly continuously upstream and packaged for enterprise Linux. And today, I think the users have shown that we're sort of serving a, serving a need that hadn't been scratched in the past, because we're getting about 1,000 unique downloads a day of RDO right now. And then, so the, so the first leg is obviously development and communities. The second leg is community distributions. And then, naturally, the last part about that is building relationships with customers. 
And as we looked at that, I think our initial thought was that, of course, you just want to bring OpenStack to customers discreetly. But what we found was that the, the technology and the work that was going on, on inside of OpenStack was, was creating new dependencies on Linux, um, unlike anything we'd ever seen before in the past three or four years. Dependencies in the Linux kernel from things like virtual switching, um, namespaces, and other containerization technologies. And so instead of actually bring, making OpenStack an a la carte subscription offering, we said, you know what, we need a whole new version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, what we call Red Hat Enterprise Linux OSP, or OpenStack platform, that goes out together as a, as a well-integrated release that has all the advanced capabilities in the operating system as well, as well that, that OpenStack relies on. You know, so, so technology is great, but, but, cons but you know, customers don't just consume point technology from vendors. They take technology from multiple vendors and expect it all to work really well today. We learned that, um, you know, first and foremost, with Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and I think that's a big part of why RHEL is so successful, it isn't just because of the technology in RHEL, it's because of that it works with, with nearly everything that a customer would like. Our own mission statement, you know, talks about Red Hat being a catalyst, not just amongst the development communities, um, it also talks about us being a catalyst with our customers, but also we, in our mission statement, talks about being a catalyst with our partners. So we sort of get that as, as job number one to make sure that we can take open source technology and make sure that it works with, with an ecosystem of thousands. And so, so what we're doing is actually the, taking a page right out of the playbook of Red Hat Enterprise Linux and now applying it to OpenStack. You know, you know, Red Hat's grown up in the, in the past 20 years, and you know, in the very early days, we were very feature-driven, but now you're seeing us move towards really trying to understand customer problems and use cases. So features have really become subservient to the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and as we look in, our, in the customer environments of today, they're very heterogeneous. Very few customers are sort of greenfield IT where they get to a clean you know, uh, slate on how, what they want to build. Most customers that we see today are running virtualization, typically VMware, inc increasingly Rev and Hyper-V, and they're also using both, already using private cloud technologies as well as public cloud technologies like Amazon. That was a big reason why we actually acquired a company called ManageIQ and now named it CloudForms, is that we wanted a way to not come into a customer environment and say, shut down everything that you're already doing and we're gonna bring you OpenStack. Instead, what we needed to tell them is say, we, we understand your current mission, we understand you can't start from a clean, um, you know, a clean slate, but we're gonna actually bring you OpenStack, but then we're also gonna bring you uh, CloudForms, which actually serves to knit all of their pre-existing virtualization environments as well as their public cloud environments together with OpenStack, and it knits it together into a seamless open hybrid cloud that allows them to do you know, uh, common, common management on top from application deployment to resource management. So you know, a product strategy is great, but really customers aren't looking for point products from vendors anymore. They're really looking for relationships. That's why we had created the subscription model in the first place. But any customer that you want to have a relationship with at a partnership level, they're going to expect a high degree of competency from you, both in terms of competency of, of the current knowledge of code, but as well as the ability to understand their problems and be able to reflect that back in the community. That's why we actually you know, participate so heavily in communities and speak so passionately about it. But rather than me to take you through all that, who better to tell you about how Red Hat has been working in the OpenStack community and our future plans than the very first engineer at Red Hat that, that put the first line of code inside of OpenStack. Please welcome Mark McLaughlin. Thank you, Brian. OK, good morning. So I've been at Red Hat almost 10 years now. And I still remember the words that persuaded me to join that Red Hat is a 100% pure play, open source company. But it was really only a few months later that this hit home for me. We got the entire company together in Raleigh in North Carolina for an all hands company meeting. And on the first morning, um, in a kind of dark, packed auditorium like this one, we showed a video for the first time. The video is called Truth Happens. And really, when I left that session, I was just incredibly pumped up and excited that you know, open source is the fight for me and that Red Hat is the place to fight it from. So this video means an awful lot to me personally, um, but I think it's really relevant to where we are today with OpenStack. So let's see the video.
Cool. Thanks very much. I'm glad you like it. So I guess the point of that video is that you know, we can have this righteous self-belief in what we're doing, even when there are skeptics and doubters out there. We can believe in the truth and inevitability of what we're doing. So th the video kind of represents a place in time for Linux <clears throat> back in 2004. And it's kind of hard to, to remember, to think back. But you know, back then, Linux did have this incredible mo momentum. Red Hat was out there proving its business model around Linux, around open source. And it was clear this was a, 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 a real disruption happening, happening in the industry. But still, it was still fashionable to be out there saying that Linux is just about hobbyists. It'll never make it in the enterprise. And it's just the hype. And so in 2013, we see headlines like th these about OpenStack. And geeks like me, we call this FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And sometimes it is just FUD. Sometimes it's those who are really challenged by what we're doing, cynically trying to undermine our credibility. But other times, it's just a question of if you're not part of what we're doing, if you're not signed up to this crusade that we're on, if you haven't drunk the Kool-Aid, then it's, it's kind of hard to believe in where we're going. And this self-belief that I'm talking about, it's, it's not complacency, right? If you, if you go along to the Design Summit sessions this week, it's not a bunch of people sitting around high-fiving each other. You know, it's not a question of mission complete for OpenStack. We know we have a ton of work left to do. Back in Portland during Brian's keynote, we showed a video called Faces of Grizzly. <clears throat> and we had some interviews from, from some of the, the contributors on the project. And I can't tell you how proud I was to see, you know, Monty, Thierry, Russell, Anne, Chris, and Doug just really wearing their hearts on their sleeves, talking about their excitement around their project, their, you know, real passion and commitment for the project. It's the strength of our convictions and the strength of the community we've built that really gives us a unique opportunity in OpenStack. But where does this strength come from? <clears throat> well, I've been around open source for over 10 years now, and I, I spend a lot of time thinking about what makes a successful open, open source company, what makes a, our open source project, what makes a project you know, strong, vibrant, and d diverse. And it's, it's really hard to define. It's no magic mix of ingredients that you put together and you're guaranteed success. It's different for each project. But I think in OpenStack, we've hit on a, a really interesting mix of approaches. We have open development and collaboration in spades. You know, this isn't a project of cliques. It's not a project of throwing code over the wall or keeping code to yourself until it's perfect. And maybe where that's most obvious is how often we see newcomers join the project and very quickly grow into be lead leaders on the project. You know, to make an impact on OpenStack, you just need to show up, contribute, be productive and constructive, make your voice heard, and before long, you'll be as much a part of the decision making as anybody else. And this is what governance is all about. I mean, if you look at OpenStack's governance structure, you see a lot of, you know, you've, we've got core review teams, we've got PTLs, the technical committee, the user committee, the foundation board of directors. And it, maybe it might seem like bureauc bureaucracy or process for the sake of process, but really the whole point of it all is just power, empowering individuals to step up and be leaders on the project. And it's really the individuals that make up this project is the magic of OpenStack. It's, it's us as individuals, individuals with our diversity of interests, but our shared ambition for OpenStack that really makes OpenStack great. But we're not just a project of individuals. You know, this is an open source project with the kind of um, corporate backing that you just don't see anywhere else. Some people like to say that this is a mixed blessing for OpenStack. You know, there's, there's some assumption here that there is this tension between our, us as a community of individuals and our corporate backing. But for me, if this is a bad thing for OpenStack, then I don't know what the ideal is. And I, I think back to when I was you know, leaving university, and you know, I'd really decided that I wanted to put as much time and energy and focus into open source as possible. And realistically, the only way for me to do that was to work on it full time, find a company that was willing to pay me to work on open source full time. And the corollary of that for me, and why I think this is so great about OpenStack, is that if you can bring together you know, companies with shared interests, shared goals for the projects, and a willingness to fund lots of contributors on the projects, you know, then you're off to a great start. 
And we've done that with OpenStack, right? We've brought together these companies and we've created the OpenStack Foundation with the mission to protect, promote, and I think most importantly, to empower the project and its community of individuals. So we've built this strong community, but where is it going? Where, where, where is this going to go over the next few years? Well, we're all familiar with the, the, the story of OpenStack's evolution to date, right? That OpenStack launched in 2010 when NASA and Rackspace put out Nova and Swift, you know, compute and object storage. These are the core infrastructure pieces. In 2011, we added some missing pieces. We added an image registry, an identity service, and a UI. And then in 2012, networking and block storage went out on their own as Neutron and Cinder. And I think at this point, for many people, this was a nice, tidy, focused definition of OpenStack's scope and mission. You know, there was this assumption for many people, I think, that OpenStack would continue to focus exclusively on these core infrastructure pieces. But for me, that never made a whole ton of sense. Firstly, because these core infrastructure pieces aren't enough on their own to really build a viable cloud service. And there's no clear, bright line between the core infrastructure pieces and the other bits you need. But most importantly, if we built this community, this awesome place for us to come together and collaborate, you know, it's perfectly natural that we'll expand to, to start tackling other problems. And so in 2013, we see two new projects have been added, Salometer and Heat. And I don't think you can really argue that these are core infrastructure pieces in the same way that our previous projects were. But you know, who wants to build a cloud without monitoring and metering? And wh why would you not want an orchestration API in your cloud? So we have this, you know, actually, I, I bring it back to the community all, all the time, right? I think about these projects long being a part of OpenStack, but more importantly, that the developers working on the project, the, 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 the teams have long been a part of our community, have built their projects from scratch, like other OpenStack projects, share the same processes and tools, same culture, and they've even contributed to other OpenStack projects. So given this community alignment and given this technical alignment, how could we not be proud of, really, really proud of these projects and want to include them in our release? So for me, when it came around to the technical committee formalizing these projects as, as OpenStack integrated projects, it was a foregone conclusion. These projects had long been a part, an integral part of OpenStack. So yes, this is an expansion of our scope, but it's not growth for growth's sake. For me, it's a very careful, deliberate, and measured growth of our scope. So what's coming next? Well, we know a few things about 2014 already. We know that Trove, the database service, has graduated from incubation and will be integrated during the Icehouse release. We know that Ironic, the bare metal service, Marconi, the queuing service, and Savannah, the Hadoop service, will all be incubating during the, the Icehouse release. Now, there's no guarantee that these projects will all graduate after one release cycle, but if they did, that would be four new projects added to OpenStack in 2014. And we know about other projects like Manila, the file systems project, Designate, the DNS project, are all making great progress, all collaborating together, and are keen to be incubated. And we've heard an awful lot about the newest project out there, Project Solemn which is a collaboration between Rackspace and Red Hat OpenShift and Docker and others to build some PaaS capabilities on top of OpenStack services. Who knows where that's going to end up in 2014? But for me personally, the one that I'm really excited to see make progress in 2014 is, is 000. So we first heard about 000 back in Portland when Monty, Robert, and the rest of the team at HP started sharing their plans and their, their vision for, for 000. And things have moved really quickly since then. 000 has since been approved as the official OpenStack deployment program. And over the summer, Red Hat started building a new service in this area called Tusker, which has now been added to 000, and the two teams have joined forces. For me, this is the big step forward that OpenStack is gonna make in 2014. This is OpenStack, the project, taking upon itself the problem of deploying and managing OpenStack. 
Now, one thing about Triple O is it is a little bit mind-bending. Um, and if it's going to be so important in 2014, I think it's worth taking just a couple of minutes to go over what, what Triple O is all about. So Triple O addresses a whole bunch of different really important topics. Um, but at, at, at its most basic, the, the most basic thing that it's trying to, to build as a, as a first order of business is an OpenStack installer. Um, so what does this installer look like? Well, one way of using it would be to put it on a USB stick like this. Um, so on this installer USB di disk, you've got all the familiar OpenStack services, but you've also got Xilometer, Heat, and, and this new service, Tusker. If you want to install a few racks of machines, the first thing you need to do is pick one of those machines as your, as your control plane, as, as, as the machine you're going to use to manage your OpenStack deployment. You boot your USB stick, and immediately you have a fully running OpenStack cloud running just on this machine. What well, we call that cloud an undercloud. And the big difference with this undercloud is that it's, it's managing bare metal machines rather than virtual machines. If you talk to Nova in this undercloud and ask it for an instance, you get back a bare metal machine. And I think the, the crucial insight here is you know, we have this service called Heat, which is there for managing and deploying multi-tier, fallout, scale-out, multi-tier, <laughs> I'm getting myself mixed up, um, multi-tier, scale-out, fault-tolerant applications. But what do you know? OpenStack is a multi-tier, fault-tolerant, scale-out application. So why not use OpenStack, or why not use Heat to describe and deploy o OpenStack? So you want to deploy OpenStack. You have an undercloud running, but the undercloud needs to know about your physical infrastructure. It needs to know about the bare metal machines and the network topology. Once it does that, you're ready to deploy your, your, your OpenStack cloud. So you talk to Tusker in your, in your undercloud, and you ask it to deploy. It builds this heat representation, this heat template of what your OpenStack cloud is going to look like. And then it starts talking to Nova to ask Nova to actually deploy the machines. Next thing that happens is perhaps Nova might just decide to deploy the two controller nodes in one of the racks first. So what happens here is Nova pixie boots these machines and provisions some images from Glance in your undercloud to these bare metal machines. It then moves on and might deploy some compute nodes in the next rack and some storage nodes in the next rack. And at the end of this process, you now have a fully functioning, multi-rack, highly available production cloud. And we call this cloud your overcloud. So you've got your undercloud, which is used to deploy your overcloud. So this isn't some far-fetched story I'm telling you here. If you go to the, the Red Hat Boost today and have a look at the rack of machines that, that we have there, we have a demo of deploying Audio, our community distribution, on these machines <coughs> using Triple O. So it works. And I think the interesting th thing that the RDMO, or the RDO demo starts to show is how flexible an architecture Triple O is. So in this demo, we're deploying RDO using standard RPMs, using standard puppet recipes. We're using this USB installer. We're, um, we're using a particular uh, deployment architecture. But this isn't all of Triple O, right? That's not, Triple O isn't prescriptive, it's intended to be flexible. So you can actually use the triple O framework to, to do all sorts of different types of OpenStack deployments. And I think the key thing is that we're trying to create, we're trying to build triple O into this place where people can come to get together, where we all can come together to collaborate on not only an OpenStack installer, not only integration between hardware and software vendors, but things like upgrades continuous deployment, reference architectures, blueprints, sharing operations knowledge. This is all within the scope of Triple O. This is, Triple O is the place where we can all come together and collaborate on these things. So I'm really excited about Triple O, and I think it's going to be the, the, the next big leap forward for OpenStack. So we're down in this Triple O rabbit hole now, so let's pull ourselves back out of there, back to 2014. But what about beyond 2014? So I started with a video from Linux in, in 2004. What about OpenStack 10 years from now? 
What about OpenStack in 2024? Does anyone really think we're going to add a handful of new projects in 2014 and then stop? That this is now the scope of OpenStack and we're not going to expand beyond that? I, I really don't think that's realistic. I think OpenStack is going to continue to expand and it's going to become quite a broad umbrella of loosely coupled projects. I think we need to get real about what this means for OpenStack, and we need to embrace the collaboration that's happening under this OpenStack umbrella. We need to evolve our culture, our governance, and our processes as needed to handle this expansion. But again, I'll say it again, we need to really make sure that this is a careful and measured expansion of, of our scope. We need to prove wrong all of those who seize this expansion as somehow a distraction from our, our work on core infrastructure. And so I talked earlier about the strength of our convictions. And for me, I often go back to our mission statement to remind me why we're all here. Because I really do think it hits on many of the key points. It talks about ubiquity. It talks about an open source cloud. It talks about public and private clouds, large and small, massively scalable. But back to triple O again, simple to implement. So we've empowered our community with this mission statement. And we will continue to de deliver on it year after year, because we know we've built this great community, this great place for us all to collaborate. And back to the video again, despite everything, truth happens. So on behalf of myself and on behalf of Red Hat, thanks for listening, here, listening thanks for being here, and thanks for being the magic that is OpenStack. Thank you. Oh, oh, <laughs> Thank you, Mark and Brian. That was a great, great talk. So